everybody doing today? Good, good, good. Go ahead and turn to your neighbor and say, good morning, neighbor. Say, I'm glad you got to see me today. Go, go do it. Say, I don't normally look this good, but you're lucky today. Just say that to him. That'll work, that'll work. Hey, really glad to see everybody this morning uh, on this beautiful day. Uh, if you're new with us, my name is Pastor Brian, and I'm the lead pastor here at Bible Christian. Let me just take a minute to introduce myself and say a special word of welcome to you. Um, and if you are a first-time guest, uh, we'd really invite you to fill out one of those Connect cards or scan that QR code in front of you and fill in your information. We'd love to get you more information about our ministries and the things uh, going on here at church. That'd be great. I also want to welcome those that are joining us online. We're glad that you guys are able to join us digitally this morning, and we're thankful that you can be with us. Um, before we go any further, um, can we just celebrate the baptisms again this morning? How good is that? And should we never tire of that? We had uh, someone baptized last week. We had someone baptized in the first service this week, a couple today, and at least one, maybe two more next week. And so we just praise God that he is on the move here in our midst and uh, never want to take that for granted, uh, what God is doing in drawing people to himself. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, well, today, I normally, if you're a guest, I normally would be the one up here speaking, but today we actually have a special guest speaker, and uh, you guys are really in for a treat. I've already heard the message this morning in the first hour, and uh, our guest speaker today is a, a friend of mine and a mentor of mine, a uh, godly man, tons of wisdom, tons of uh, experience, and he is my mentor. His name is Marty Mosher. He is the lead pastor at the Cowboy Church of Brenham, Texas, okay, uh, so not too awful far away from us. But he has been a great friend and a, a great encourager and counselor over the years for me. Now, uh, he told me this morning that he's actually, I didn't realize this, but he's actually 63. So he's getting up there in years. He says, but he, he, says his, uh, he makes up for his age with his immaturity. That's what he told me. So uh, I, I really think you guys are going to enjoy him. He's, he's actually been a pastor and in ministry for over 40 years. Uh, this is the third church that he's been the lead pastor of. And then there was a stint in there about 10 or 11 years where he was actually a church planning strategist where he helped other churches get planted, uh, done some amazing things for God, uh, has just been a great person to pick his brain over the years for me, and uh, I count him a friend, and uh, love this brother, he's going to do a great job this morning. So with all that said, I want to welcome Marty Mosher to the stage, and let's give him some love this morning as he comes up. Well, it is really, really good to be with you today. I'm really not sure what I'm doing here. I'm supposed to be on vacation. This guy calls me up. As preach. I tried everything I could to get out of it, but another reason I'm not sure what I'm doing here is I pastor a cowboy church, okay? What, and you're, if you're wondering, what are we doing bringing in a cowboy church pastor to Bible Christian Church in Garden City? I can understand that. I get it. Cowboy church is a little bit different, quite a bit different, actually. In fact, this may give you an idea of what it's like. One of our cowboy church pastors was attending, and he was going to speak at the Baptist Associational meeting about cowboy churches. And they had the typical Baptist covered dish supper beforehand. He's going through the food line, getting his food. And a little lady from the First Baptist Church comes down and confronts him and says, Is it true what I've heard? Is it true that at the Cowboy Church, you encourage them to drink? He took off his hat, smiled, and said, Ma'am, at the Cowboy Church, they don't need any encouragement. <laughs> now, that'll kind of give you an idea. It's a little bit different at Cowboy Church. But I am glad to be here. And really the reason I'm here is God brought our paths together in a unique way that you're going to hear more about in the message today because it fits with our message series. It's a setup, how God uses circumstances that may not be the best to bring about his will and his purposes and his vision for our life. So that's going to come up a little bit later in the series and in the service and in the message today. And so what we're going to be learning is we're going to be learning from Joseph's life. It's a setup. We're learning lessons from Joseph's life. And the lesson we're going to learn today is a New Testament concept called perseverance, how to keep on keeping on. And we're going to learn about that. Brian started it off last week. Pastor Brian started it off by giving us a little background on Joseph, how he was his father's pet. He went from his father's pet to the pit. Brian kind of left us in the pit last week. I listened to that message driving down the road on vacation. And so we're going to pick it up from there and tell a little bit of the story. And we're going to see how Joseph had highs and lows in his life like we all do. We're going to talk about that today and how God used that in his life, how he wants to use it in our life. I heard about a little boy who had a really bad day at school. He had one of those horrible, very bad, no good days, you know. You probably had some when you were at school. And he went to his grandmother's house after school, which is what he usually did, and he told his grandmother that he had had a very bad, horrible, no good day. 
and was whining about it. And she said what grandmothers would usually say, would you like grandma to get you a snack and make you feel better? Well, he thought that was a good idea. So she went in the kitchen and she came back with a cup of cooking oil and handed it to him. He said, no, that's not a snack. That's yucky, grandma. So he went back into the kitchen. She went back. She got some flour, a bowl of flour, and brought it in. No, I don't want that. He went several ingredients, bacon, powder. She went and cracked two eggs and brought the two eggs into him raw. He didn't want any of that. It's all yucky. And finally, of course, Grandma said, you probably know where it's going. She said, well, how would you like, could you believe that Grandma could take all these yucky things and make you a really yummy cake? He thought that was a great idea. And she said, for you to get the cake, you're going to have to trust that Grandma can do it. You're going to have to believe I can take all this yucky and make something good out of it. And you're going to have to wait for me to do it. And while you're waiting, I want you to do your homework. Well, folks, that's what we're going to learn today. That's exactly what God is up to in the yucky in our life. That's what he's up to doing in our life. He wants us to learn to wait on him, to trust him while we're waiting on him. That's called perseverance. And he's going to have some homework, some lessons for us to learn along the way. So today we're going to continue that series. Our first scripture is a New Testament scripture that sets us up for it's a setup today. It's Romans 8, 28, my favorite verse in the Bible. And it says what we just learned about grandma's cake in our lives. It says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Now, this is my favorite verse, but it isn't my favorite verse because it says everything's going to be good, because that's not what the verse says. The verse doesn't say that God only allows good things in our life. It doesn't say that. It says that God will take all of the things in our life and he will work them together for his highest purpose in our life. And his highest purpose is always our greatest good. And so if we know the Lord, love the Lord, and are called according to his purpose, God is at work in our life. And we're going to see that in the life of Joseph in the Old Testament today as we see him keeping on, keeping on exhibiting perseverance through all the ups and downs of life. We're going to see today, we saw how he went from father's pet to the pit. We're going to see how he went from prison to prime minister in an amazing way how God used all the ups and downs in his life. We all face ups and downs in life, don't we? That's just kind of the way it is, right? We always face up and downs. I want you to look at this slide here because sometimes we don't like all the ups and downs. I want you to look at the next slide here. There's two images there, okay? Which one do you prefer to be your life? <laughs> we typically think, well, we don't want all these ups and downs, but if you don't have ups and downs in your life, what does it say? You're dead. <laughs> in other words, everyone has ups and downs in life, and we probably think sometimes that ours are greater than anybody else's. Well, Joseph had tremendous crazy ups and downs in his life. We're going to tell a little bit of the story, picking up where Pastor Brian told it last week. He really did. You'll find this in Genesis chapters 37 through 45, the first book of the Bible. I want you to listen patiently as I read all nine chapters to you this morning. I tell you what, we'll condense it down, and you go read it on your own. Okay, Pastor Brian started the story last week, Joseph's beginning, that he was a young man with big dreams. He was a dreamer, and God gave him dreams that meant something. He had a vision for Joseph's life, and Joseph, being a cocky 17-year-old, got all excited about that. He was his father's favorite. The other brothers knew it, didn't like it, of course, and they were evil. And so Joseph bragged about it, which was just a sign of his immaturity, which I know a lot about, being immature. And he incurred the wrath of his brothers, and they decided that they were going to kill him. So that roller coaster of life for him was up, up, up when he got all these dreams from God. Click, click, click up. But then his brothers, crappy men are going to kill him, and it's down, down, down from there. But one older brother doesn't want him to be killed, but he knows he can't overpower the brothers. So Reuben, an older brother, has a plan to trick him. And he says, let's not kill him. Let's just throw him in this old well over here. Let's just throw him in the cistern, let him die there. Now, he'd be just as dead, of course, but the brothers don't know that Reuben's plan is to come back later and rescue him and him not be killed. So up, up, up goes his life because he's going to be rescued. Except Reuben is gone for a while out there where they're herding sheep and a caravan of slave traders comes by and the brothers get this great idea. We'll make money off of him. We won't kill him. We'll just sell him to be a slave. And Joseph is sold as a slave, down, 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 goes his life, and he's taken to Egypt as a slave. 
But the man that bought him is a wealthy person with a big estate. He's a uh, administrator in the administration of the king, Pharaoh. And so Joseph is given favor with this man, and this man likes Joseph and puts him in charge of the whole operation of his household. And so up, up, up goes his life again. But while Joseph is there working in the house one day, Potiphar, the man who bought him, Potiphar's wife, comes and tries to get him to commit adultery, tempts him and says, come to bed with me. And Joseph runs from there. He does the right thing, but she grabs his coat. His coat comes off, and she uses that as the slim evidence to charge him with rape because she was scorned. She tells her husband that he tried to rape me, and on that flimsy evidence, Joseph is put in prison for attempted rape. Down, down, down goes Joseph's life. But once again, God gives him favor in prison, and the warden makes him like an assistant warden, a trustee. Click, click. I'm only going to give him two clicks up because he's still in prison, okay? <laughs> it's just a little bit better because he's in charge of something. And so Joseph is there in prison. God has given Joseph this dreaming ability and the ability to interpret dreams. And while he's there, he interprets two dreams of two of the prisoners there. The two prisoners are the baker of Pharaoh who fell into disfavor and got thrown into prison and the cupbearer of Pharaoh the king. Now, I don't know what a baker would have to do to get thrown into prison. I guess he burnt the brownies or something. But Pharaoh threw him in prison. And I don't know what a cupbearer would do because a cupbearer's job was to sip the drinks of Pharaoh before he got them to see if they were poisoned. He must have done a good job. He was still alive. Pharaoh was still alive. So I don't know what he did to get in prison. Maybe he spit in the cup when he had a bad day or something and got caught. But what we do know is two men were in prison. They were servants of Pharaoh. We do know that they dreamed dreams and that Joseph interpreted them. This is important in the whole story because it leads to what God's doing in his life. The first dream, that of the baker, was not good news, the interpretation. It was that he was going to be executed, and that's exactly what happened. But it was good news for the cupbearer. It was that he was going to be reinstated to his position, taken out of prison, and that's exactly what happened. And he promised Joseph that he would tell Pharaoh that Joseph was innocent, was a smart guy that could interpret dreams and get him out of prison. Click, 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 up goes Joseph's hopes. But as soon as he gets out of prison, the cupbearer forgets all about Joseph and doesn't say anything to Pharaoh. Down, down, down goes Joseph's life. But later, Pharaoh has a dream. It troubles him. You can read about it. Excuse me. You can read about it in Genesis. He has this dream. I won't go into the dream, but the interpretation of it, Joseph can do. And the cupbearer realizes that, and he realizes, I've been a doofus. I should have said something. So he says to Pharaoh, I, I know somebody who can interpret your dream. He's in prison. He's innocent, by the way. And you need to get him out. And so Joseph is taken out of prison and brought before Pharaoh to interpret the dream. Up, up, up goes the roller coaster of life. And he interprets the dream, and the interpretation is there's going to be seven years of great harvest, great rain, great abundance, then seven years of a famine and starvation. And while Joseph was telling the interpretation, he suggested some things that Pharaoh could do with that. Smart of Joseph to do that, to put that in there. And so Pharaoh says, this guy knows what he's doing. He can interpret dreams. Who else should be in charge? And he is made immediately on the spot, prime minister, the second in command in all of Egypt. Joseph went from prisoner to prime minister, just like that, in all of the ups and downs of life. An amazing, amazing thing. Now, Pastor Brian's going to share the end of the story, the rest of the story, and some important principles next week. So you need to be with us next week for that. But today we just summarize this part by saying now Joseph is prime minister after having gone from prisoner to assistant warden, after having gone from slave to ranch manager, after having gone from favored son to a nearly executed brother and thrown in a pit. All of those ups and downs in life. And there's no way that Joseph or you or I or anyone could go through those ups and downs of life without a character trait called perseverance keeping on, keeping on through trials. And there's no way that we can develop perseverance, Joseph couldn't, without going through trials. And what we're going to see today for two takeaways, two life lessons from this story of Joseph, our two life lessons are the two choices that Joseph made, the two things that allowed him to persevere through trials. And here's the first one. If you're going to persevere through trials like Joseph did, first of all, don't forget that God is with you wherever you go. You may want to write that in your notes. We've heard this summary of Joseph's story today. 
found in Genesis. We're going to look at some selected verses that have significance for today's message. The first one is when Joseph is sold as a slave by his brothers, purchased by Potiphar, and taken away from his home and taken to Egypt. Here's what Genesis 39.2 says about that. The Lord was with Joseph. Even in slavery, even far from home, even in bad circumstances, the Lord was with Joseph. And then Joseph is given charge of Potiphar's entire estate, even though he began and was bought to be just a common slave. But that ends with him being falsely accused and sent to prison. And so when he's in prison, we read this again in Genesis 39, 20. While Joseph was in prison, the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. And the warden put him in charge of the prison. Now, after that, Pharaoh fetches him out of prison and he interprets the dream and all of that. And we read this in Genesis 41. You shall be in charge of my palace. Genesis 41, 40, and 41. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are su to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Folks, do y'all see a trend developing here in Joseph's life? Yes, there's ups and downs, but he perseveres through all the trials, and God never left him, even in the trials. Because God was with him, and he knew God was with him, he could continue to persevere. He could keep on keeping on. I mean, I marvel at his ability. I consider him a Bible hero. But we're going to see that everything that he had to persevere, we have as well. God was with him. He persevered through nearly being executed by his brothers, being sold as a slave, falsely accused of rape and put in prison, forgotten by the cupbearer. But Joseph didn't have anything of his own power or ability that could change any of those circumstances, did he? Sometimes we have circumstances, there's nothing, they're beyond our control. There's nothing we can do about them. But Joseph had the one thing that he needed, and it's the same thing that's available to you and I if we're followers of Christ, and that is the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. He was with him in prison. He was with him in that pit that Pastor Brian talked about last week. He was with him when he was falsely accused. And I marvel at his ability to do it. But it's an ability that all of us have if we're in Christ. Because you see, Christ persevered to the cross. The Bible says that he despised the shame, but looking forward to the joy that was before, the ups and downs of life, he went to the cross for you and me. And now if we've trusted Christ, he lives in us by his Holy Spirit, and we have his perseverance if we'll remember that the Lord is with us. I have a song on my playlist that is sung and written from the standpoint that it's God saying it to us. And it says, you always think I'm somewhere on a mountaintop, but never think behind bars. You'd be amazed the places that I go just to be with you where you are. That's God's heart for you. Hebrews 13, 5 says it this way. I will never leave you or forsake you, says the Lord. That's the promise God has for you. Whatever you're going through, I couldn't possibly know the ups and downs of life that you're experiencing. But I know this, everybody in this room and everybody with us live online or will watch this message later, every one of us is either in a time of trouble, we've just come out of a time of trouble, or soon we'll be heading in one. Now that may sound negative, but it's just the fact that trouble is a part of this life. But the Lord promised he would be with us. The Lord is not just with you on the top of the mountain, he's with you at the very pit, in the bottom of a jail. The, the Lord is with you when the doctors are confounded and say the cancer was there, but it's gone now. It must be a miracle. And he's there with you when the chemotherapy makes you too weak to stand. God is not just with you when you say, I do at the altar. He's with you when, God forbid, the other person says, I don't in divorce court. God doesn't leave you. He doesn't forsake you in any of those circumstances. God doesn't leave us in those situations. He's there when the accident that should have happened miraculously doesn't. He's there when the accident that shouldn't have happened tragically does. God is there in all of the circumstances of life for those who trust him. In this old fallen world, Jesus never promised we'd have a trouble-free life. Some preachers would like you to know that. They would like you to believe that and send them your money, that all you got to do is pray it away and you'll prosper no matter what. That's not what Jesus said. Look at what Jesus said to his closest followers, John 16, 33. In this world, you will have trouble. 
but be of good cheer, for I have overcome this world. Years ago, Lori and I had the privilege of planting a church in a suburb of Austin, and we started out with just the two of us, and then we, we had a little home group going of people that were interested in starting the church. And we had neighbors around the corner, Amy and Bob, and they, they were really nice folks, and we liked our neighbors. They weren't church-going folks. They were like me, like some of you may have been, or some of you checking out church live online. I didn't, wasn't raised in church, didn't grow up in church, and uh, Amy had not been in church any. But she did. they did come to the home group some, and she also came to a Bible study that lady, ladies' Bible study Lori led. And so Amy came to faith in Christ through that. She put her faith in Jesus, believing that what the baptism candidates told us today, that they believe that Jesus came from God as God in the flesh. He gave his perfect life, his sinless life that he lived, as an atoning sacrifice, completely paying for our sins and rising from the dead. Amy believed that. She trusted. She put her faith in Jesus, and she was brought into a relationship with God. But a few months later, she tragically had a miscarriage. And she was talking with Lori about it, and she said, I just don't understand. You know, I'm following Jesus. I've put my trust in him. I'm faithfully following him. I don't understand why God would allow me to suffer this way. And Lori's answer was, of course, that she can't tell her the whys behind the what. But Lori said, I know that because of the fallen world and things that happened, you were going to have this miscarriage, whether you'd put your trust in Jesus or not. But now that you've put your trust in Jesus, you're not alone in it. He is with you wherever you go, whatever you're going through. First takeaway today from Joseph's story is, don't forget that God is with you wherever you go in all the ups and downs of life. The second one is, do right even when things go wrong. Do right even when things go wrong. Joseph started out as a common slave on the way to Egypt, and pretty quickly he was rising up as head of the household. But he could have just thought of himself as a common slave. He could have become bitter about that. He could have become bitter about the circumstances that he had to go to Egypt and leave his home and leave his family. But as Pastor Brian shared last week, and I encourage you to go back and listen to that message if you were not able to be with us, and it'll put it all together. As he shared last week, God had a great vision for Joseph's life. And he wasn't finished with Joseph, even though he was going through trials, even though he was going through a rough time. And his vision for his life was more than just his own comfort or his own happiness. His vision, as you'll see more about next week as well, and if you watch last week's message, was to rescue not only Joseph, but through that you'll find, as we get the rest of the story, he rescued Joseph's whole family from famine through that. He also rescued them so that they would become a great nation, and they did, the nation of Israel. And from that nation, he brought the Savior, Jesus Christ. It was a big vision for his life. As Pastor Brian shared. But Joseph had to hold on to that vision, and to do that, he had to do right even when things were going wrong. Joseph could have decided several things. He could have gotten a victim mentality and decided, I don't deserve to be a slave, this is wrong. And he could have started embezzling from his boss, from Potiphar. I think he could have gotten away with it, perhaps. He was in charge of the whole household. He was trusted, take a little here, take a little here, put it aside, and then after a year, get out of slavery. He could have done that. But he didn't. He did right instead of doing wrong. He could have given in to Potiphar's wife's advances. He was a young single man with no prospects of marriage, it looked like. He could have said, I don't, I don't think that God has anything for me, and I'm a victim, and I deserve this. He could have self-medicated by participating in adultery with her. She was more than willing. Who was to know? Everybody's doing it. He could have given any excuses he wanted to. Like many of us do when we self-medicate through illegal drugs or sex outside of marriage, or overuse of alcohol, medicating our pain from the circumstances that we find ourselves in. But Joseph decided that he would do right even when things were going wrong. Did you know that doing right is its own reward? And did you realize that doing right will always work out the best in the long run? Folks, if you get nothing else, get this today. God's will is what you would choose every single time if you knew all the outcomes. You just don't know all the outcomes. Now, I changed that a little for me. I say God's will for me is what I would choose every single time if I knew all the outcomes and if my chooser wasn't broke. Because sometimes I just want what I want. How about you? I just want what I want immediately. Remember the lesson of the cake and the grandma. You're going to have to wait. There's going to be some homework. There's going to be some lessons that you have to learn along the way. 
But doing right will be its own reward, and it will always work out best in the long run. Now, these principles we've learned today about perseverance played out in the life of Lori and I, my wife Lori and I, in our ministry a few years back in a way that I want to share today a story because our roller coaster ride was doing like this, and you didn't even know it, we didn't even know it, but Pastor Brian and his family, and by, because of that, you as a church were tied to our roller coaster ride, and we didn't even know it. Here was our roller coaster ride. A few years ago, Lori and I were called away from my church strat- strategist job, called to New Hope Church, where Pastor Brian was a campus pastor, and we were called to Durham, North Carolina, to start a campus in Columbia, South Carolina. And I was to be campus pastor. Lori was to be the children's minister. And they called us there for that. We bought a house a mile from the building where the campus was to meet in Columbia. And we got an apartment in Durham because we were going to be there for three to six months training. Splitting time. We'd be two nights down in Columbia meeting people. It was exciting that were interested in helping start the campus of New Hope. We were meeting people like Pastor Ryan and Sonia and their family and building a rapport. And three months into that, Three months into that, we were called in by the leadership, and the leadership of New Hope said, we owe you an apology. We're moving too fast. We're going to have to put the brakes on the Columbia campus. We know you bought a house down there, and we're really sorry, but we have jobs for you here in Durham, but you're going to need to stay here in Durham indefinitely if you stay with us. Now, we're not quitters. We would have fought through it and persevered, but the last thing they said was, however, we know this isn't what you signed up for. And so if you were to seek other ministry opportunities, then we would tell anybody it was our fault and we'd give you a high recommendation, but we hope you'll stay. They said, pray about it for two weeks. We prayed about it for two days (laughs) because the reality is I had a wife who was ready to go back to Texas. And during my consulting back in my Texas days, I had been consulting a church, Cowboy Church of Brenham, Texas. I was consulting them for their pastor search. I had continued consulting them for their pastor search even though I wasn't in that job because I didn't want to just drop them. And so two days after we got the bombshell of our life, we have a home. We're going to have to work three and a half hours from where we bought a big home. We, we're a thousand miles from home and our family. We don't know what the future holds. Two days after that, the chairperson of the Cowboy Church of Brenham called me. And at the start of the search, they had offered me the pastor position. And I declined it. I said, I'm not a cowboy. I believe in what you're doing with the Cowboy Church. But that's not us. We're going to New Hope. Lori and I had agreed God wanted us to go to New Hope. And I believe he did because he had a purpose in it. So this chairman calls and he says, I've heard through the grapevine. First, I consulted him some on their search. He said, we have 53 resumes. There's not more than three of them we would accept as our pastor. And they're not willing to come. Got any advice for us? And he also said, I've heard your circumstances have changed through some friends I had back in Texas that they knew. And he said, if your circumstances have changed, our desire had in which to like you to be the pastor of Cowboy Church. And so I said, I think I can buy me some boots and get a hat because my wife wants to go back to Texas. And suddenly, God used all that. He used that nine months interim that they had to help the church be prepared for a new pastor. He used it to prepare our hearts and be ready to go pastor a cowboy church. And God has done amazing things since then. He gets all the glory for it. But in the four and a half years since we came there, me saying, I can't be a pastor of a cowboy church, I can't. God said, I've got a vision for your life. I've got a plan. I can enable you to do that. I took riding lessons, got a horse. I didn't have to learn to talk different. You can tell that. I was just fine on that case. I'm a hick from East Texas. I may not be a cowboy, but I'm a hick. But God has done amazing things. The church has doubled in attendance. We've gone from meeting in a dance hall that didn't have children's space to a 600-seat auditorium on 39 acres of land with a children's ministry space, state-of-the-art for Cowboy Church, a youth ministry center. The church has gotten younger because I make up for my age with my immaturity, and I told them they had to hire my wife as a children's ministry director and start a new children's ministry. She started Kids Jamboree. They went from eight kids in a 30-minute Sunday school to six classes with sometimes 40, 50, 60, 70. I think you've had 200 different kids come to Kids Jamboree. The church has gotten younger. It's doubled in attendance. God did all of that. People ask me the secret. What's the secret? I'll be in town. What's the secret? We're here. Your church is growing. What's the secret? I said, the secret is the pastor sleeping with the children's minister. That's the secret. Okay. <laughs> Now, get this, if you're live online and you missed some of it, I'm married to her for 42 years, okay, but having a children's ministry. But I say all of that to say this, here's how you're part of our story. That was our setup. God was setting us up through the ups and downs of life. But shortly after we got there, Pastor Brian called us from New Hope, and he wanted to ask us about 
the circumstances of our leaving and us leaving with no place to go. He had heard we did that because God was stirring in him that he was to be preaching more and being in a lead pastor position. And at the same time, the New Hope leadership came to him and said, we have great plans for your campus, but we need to know you. We have a long-term commitment from you <laughs> to do that. Is that right, Brian? I get it right? And so through that process of agonizing, Brian had to do the right thing and tell them, no, my heart's in lead pastoring. And he had to resign as a result of that. There was some time there, but he had to resign going not knowing, just as we did. Now, Sonia, if you're, she's home with a sick child. If you're online listening or watch this later, I did not tell Brian to resign without a place to go and no job. He did it anyway, but I didn't tell him to. I said things like, you know, me and Lori have some savings. Our kids are grown. Your situation's different. I wouldn't do that. But he really had to. He had to do right even when things were going wrong because he couldn't lie to the people there that were asking him a direct question, and they weren't going to keep him on long. And so God set that up, and that's how it comes into your story because Brian and I continued to, to talk on the phone and share with one another as he was going through a search process and praying about where God would want him. And he probably doesn't want me to tell you this, but during that time period, there's a church in Texas of over 25,000 people who had him come preach for them. That happened. Did I just dream that? When you told me, I, I'm not going to mention the church, when you told me you were going, I think I was smoking something. I mean, there's no way they're going to, you went and preached there, didn't you? But God had a plan for him. I remember telling him, I never dreamed I'd be at a cowboy church. They've told I, we love cowboy church. We love Brenham. I never dreamed I'd be in Brenham. He, he, he's told me since then how much they love Garden City and Bible Christian Church, but they never would have even known where Garden City was. It was a setup, folks, and all we had to do, the Wilsons and the Mosiers, all we had to do was do what was right, even when things were going wrong, and not forget that God was with us. That's what we had to do. That's all that had to happen. It was a setup, just like Joseph's life, through all the ups and downs of life. God was at work in this. So we end with this. We started with the promise that he'd work it all together for good. Make that yucky turn into something yummy, like that cake. But there was two conditions on that. You got to love the Lord and be called according to his purpose. Do you love the Lord and are you called according to his purpose? Because those are the conditions. And whether you're with us live online or here in the building, if you've never come to know Jesus, to know him is to love him, but you got to get to know him before you're going to love him. <coughs> excuse me, and be called according to his purpose. So I want to close with this. There was a setup for you. The cross where Jesus died, you realize it was a setup, don't you? Now, just as Potiphar's wife was setting Joseph up for prison, but God had him be prime minister, the Romans that crucified Jesus thought they were getting rid of a troublemaker. So did the religious leaders. But it was a setup for you. It was God's purpose that he die for you so you could have eternal life. You may say, I don't know enough. I, I, I haven't learned enough. But God's speaking to your heart today. I want to end with this final scripture. There were two thieves hung on either side of Jesus. Jesus on the middle cross. Our last scripture is Luke chapter 23. Originally, both of the thieves hurled abuse and cursing and insults at Jesus. We read that in another place in the Bible. But one of them changed his mind. The Bible word for that is repented. You can't be saved until you repent. He repented. He changed his mind about Jesus. And here's what he said. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save us and your, yourself and us. But the other responded and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God since we are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our crimes. But this man has done nothing wrong. He admitted he was a sinner. And he said, was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He called on the name of the Lord. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, perhaps you're here today and you're not sure who Jesus is or you're with us live online and you're wondering and you say, well, I just don't know enough yet. I want you to imagine with me this man who went to heaven that day. Jesus said he would be in heaven and he went to heaven. I want you to imagine this man who was a criminal who hadn't been religious, wasn't a churchgoer, didn't know much of anything. Imagine him getting to heaven, and imagine, hypothetically, it's not true, but imagine there's an intake angel that has to get his story. So the intake angel asks him and says, how'd you get in here? Looking at him, he doesn't look like the type, you know. How'd you get in here? I don't know. I just died on a cross, and 
here I am in this amazing place. He said, well, I, I need to get your story. Tell me what you know about the doctrine of justification by grace through faith. I said, what? You know, what do you know about the doctrine of total depravity and sin? He said, well, I recognize that word sin. I've done a lot of that, but somehow I don't think I need to talk about that. And in exasperation, the intake angel says, I've got to put something down. How did you get to heaven? And with wonder and amazement and tears of joy, the guy says, the man on the middle cross said I could come. The man on the middle cross said I could come. Now, I need to let you know this today. If you don't know Jesus... He's the man on the middle cross, and he said you can come. You can come to know him by putting your faith in Jesus, by believing he died for you and rose again, and just asking him to come into your life, giving up, transferring your trust from the best you can do to please God to the best God did in giving his son Jesus for you. And then you come to know him, and then you will come to know him is to love him, to love him is to trust him, and then to trust him is to obey him. He will give you the power to do what's right even when things go wrong, and you'll know he's with you wherever you go. Let's bow in prayer. And as we pray, if that's where you're at, just tell God that. People say, well, can, I just don't believe a prayer can save you. No, Jesus saves you. Prayer is the way you tell him you want him to, and you put your faith in him. And for the rest of him, let's just remember and think about the two takeaways that are on your sheet that you can fill in later that you need to think about what it is you're going through that's going wrong that you need to do right in. That's the second one. And the first one is, what is it that you're going through that you need to remember God is with you? Father, we pray today that as we go from this place today, that this week, whatever we're going through or going into, we'll remember that you're with us wherever we go. And Lord, that we will do right in your strength and power even when things go wrong and we pray in Jesus.